record. Okay, so rewinding. Okay, so it's 5.30, we'll, uh, 5.31. We'll get going on the, um, on this process, on this uh, particular workshop. What um, the other one was particularly content rich and then we did um, go over a little bit. I'm not sure what's gonna happen on this one, but I tried to reduce the content a little bit. It's very difficult because there is a lot to talk about as we move forward on the plan. Um, and infrastructure, as I noted in the last workshop is a, a heavy duty lift. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, I've, I've pared down the, the comments and insights section so that we can get, there's about two or three of them, so we can really get some more intensive discussion in those uh, particular sections. Um, so I'm going to go through this. Um, we are, let me bring this over here. Come on. Okay. And you should be going down, right? One second. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to do a very brief uh, recap. Um, as we noted earlier, uh, for those who weren't in attendance at the last uh, workshop on, on Tuesday's workshop, um, this planning uh, document and the, uh, the master plan is from the perspective of the user, uh, from, from the person who is using the trail uh, that was um, that laid out at the right from the beginning that it would be good to perceive this as an outside visitor. But we also were respecting the, um, the viewpoints and the planning perspective of stakeholders, as well as DEP and the uh, DEP Bureau of Outdoor Recreation. So I went over last time the different elements that we're looking at in the trail. These are not the titles of the chapters, but um, they give you kind of a rundown of the things that we're looking at in depth. So the bold is the infrastructure and maintenance is what we're talking about tonight. And um, so there's another recap. The, um, and it's an important recap because we're going to refer back to some of these groups, um, not necessarily specifically the groups, but um, the stakeholders who exist within these groups, of which many of you are on this call. Um, and if you can take back some of this information to your groups, it'd be really helpful and then communicate it to the groups. Uh, again, this workshop will be uh, a video. We'll have it on the website. Kelly should have it up by tomorrow. Um, but it's um, the stakeholder groups are critical to understanding the give and take on infrastructure and maintenance on the trail, um, especially trail committees um, who are working on the trail. There are a few towns who have very active trail committees who do maintenance on the trail. And then again, another recap is the um, why are we doing this? Um, because I think it's important to understand why it matters is that the uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, possibilities inherent in the trail um, and a, a build out of the trail. And we'll get out the type of build out. Uh, Kevin and I talked about that earlier today. We've been talking about that for a while. But it's important to understand that the trail has significant economic um, uh, output in terms of its proximity to the 12 towns that are next to it, as well as the influence re regions such as the Hop River Trail um, and other influence regions that I talked about at the last workshop. So that was just a recap. So let's get into infrastructure and maintenance. Um, so th that's just a quick thing that we can, anybody can go back and read. But basically, um, we have Kevin Grindle from Barton and Legitis and myself. Um, Kevin was the, took, took the heavy lift on visiting most of the communities. Many of, he works with many of the communities already on the airline trail um, and has, a, has an in-depth knowledge of um, actual conditions on the trail and he can introduce himself later. But um, so visiting each of the communities and we talked to, it lists there, but we talked to a breadth of various individuals. And then in my role, I'd either be with Kevin or I would meet with people through the environmental review team process out on the trail um, as we walk the trail with town selectmen or trail representatives or land trusts or other entities. So our findings, um, each community was a unique in their approach to the ongoing concerns and process for interacting with DEP and also maintaining the trail. Um, our findings are that some towns were very active in grant applications toward major improvements, recognizing the value of the trail to the town's economic portfolio. 
Um, this includes providing that 20% match to recreational trails grants. And then there are some towns who defer to DEP as the state park owner to do the maintenance and improvements and just hope that it happens at some point. And then they have engaged interest, but not active interest in pursuing uh, intensive recreational grant projects or what Kevin and I um, have termed or Kevin has termed Cadillac projects. So then we have um, uh, just the first phase. Uh, we worked on that from November 2021 through October 2022 for the initial surveys. And then we're following up with a phase between December and February with uh, follow-up discussions um, with contacts to describe best management examples toward recommendations that we're gonna have. Um, and then we will have that in the draft plan. You'll be seeing that in the draft plan. If anybody's interested in those draft recommendations because you have a specific interest in infrastructure or maintenance, please email me and I'll put you on a separate list. And I can, like if you're a public works director or a park and rec, or you're a trails committee person that's very interested in what the recommendations are, would like to help us um, as we evaluate the final recommendations for the draft plan, please email me and I will be happy to, or communicate that to anybody that you may know. And uh, we will include you and possibly have a little uh, small meeting with you uh, between now and the draft plan. So um, invasives. So there's an element of this plan also that I wanted to cover. Um, we, uh, uh, because we didn't want to talk just about infrastructure because there are other elements to, you know, the brick and mortar um, be, in, in, in maintenance. Um, and I wanted to provide you an example of those items that are not brick and mortar that we're looking at in, when it comes to infrastructure and maintenance, primarily maintenance. And invasives is, um, an issue on the trail, um, invasive species and plants. Um, this particular photo was near a farm in Lebanon when we were out there. Um, and it was pretty much taking over that portion of the trail. And uh, we, we, we noted that um, it is of concern. So uh, the people on the walk, um, and thank you to Charlotte Pyle, who uh, directed me to Todd Mervosh. Um, and I've talked to Todd and he will be um, helping us provide some recommendations within the plan. Um, I believe he's on that call. He can always pipe in if he wants to, but he has an expertise. I've worked with him on a, another ERT and was very impressed with, it was a, it was a large natural management plan, um, open space management plan for Durham um, that they were particularly focused on invasives management. And um, Todd has an excellent background in that. Uh, so he will be our consultant on uh, those elements of the trail where we're trying to figure out what to do about a 50 mile long corridor. We've got invasives on either side of the trail um, impinging on the, uh, on, the, on the bikeway or the walkway. Um, and there are different management guides. Um, this, I just put a link to one of them uh, about, you know, talk conservation tools that, you know, in my, in my search, but we will have more information on that. Um, as we move forward on invasives, but I wanted you to note that. The other one, um, I'm not sure if Charlotte is on the call, but um, on this workshop, but Charlotte Pyle um, is providing us with some support as we explore the concept of pollinator pathways. So once you get the invasives under control, or if you have particular areas that are um, ideal for pollinator pathways, um, there are two towns currently, East Hampton and Hebron in Connecticut, who have pollinator pathway committees and groups that part are participating in the Connecticut Pollinator Pathway Project. Um, and I have a link there to, um, to that, that organization. And there's an opportunity here for not quite as, um, not quite as intensive, but more fun, multi-generational um, engagement with the with the airline trail. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to be a bicyclist or a horseback rider, or you can you know, meet up with groups. It's, a, it's an opportunity to not only benefit the trail, but to engage in the trail. So it's building your regional awareness through different means. 
um, toward the trail. So we will include that as a mechanism for, you know, what Laura, what Kim brought up last time, which is like, how do you make the um, the trail a recreational trail that has multiple um, attractions for different group sets? And so this was just sort of a, a slide that um, Charlotte has been pulling together for us. Um, she is um, co-chair of the Connecticut Invasive Plants Working Group um, out of UConn. They, they have their, I mean, their conference at UConn. I think Todd is also on that group. Um, and there's some links here um, to provide if anybody wants to do further investigation. But um, these are just a couple of slides of the types of pollinators that could be grown um, or considered on the airline trail. So I just, I happened, this is a, from my walk, one of my walks on the trail um, and visits and noticing that this, I had just come out of an area where on the right side, um, it was interesting because on the right side, there was extensive invasives and on the left side, there weren't. <coughs> then I came into this area where it was um, a potential for, for both controlling the invasives and then replanting with pollinators. So that was just a fun photo for that. So um, comments and insights um, on, on these ideas so far, or what I've talked about so far. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments? Did I hear you see Frank? Yes, hey, thank you very much for asking for comments on this, uh, Jean. Um, actually, I, this is one of my things I really want to point out to you know, the towns and maybe the DEP, because um, as we know, the, the beauty on the Airline Trail is amazing. And part of the fun going out there on trails is to see all the native vegetation. And uh, actually the Airline Trail can be um, considered a pollinator pathway if it's managed properly. And what's been going on though, I've been noticing, and I'm not sure if it's a town thing or a, a state issue, but the maintenance along the trail is, you know, in some cases quite aggressive to the point where, you know, you, if you cut down all the uh, native plants along the trail and then you, then you wind up getting invasive species coming in instead because mowing is being done at the wrong time of the year or it's been done too aggressively. So like the picture you just showed in Lebanon is a, a huge invasive uh, patch of uh, mugwort, which, which actually the same thing happened in Colchester next to, next to the Norton Pond, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, and that is because the, the mowing is being done at the wrong time of the year, uh, especially for like for the sort of invasive bases like mugwort to take over. They've been taking away the, the um, native plants' ability to pollinate um, with their seed drop and so forth. So really, the pollinated pathway has a um, I think like a policy or a suggestion that mowing should be done generally like in late winter or early spring, so you can leave the pollinator native plants up all winter. So they can drop their seeds and so forth, and the birds can eat the seeds during the winter time. But mowing at the wrong time of the year, which often happens in the summertime or in the fall when things are blooming, it, is, it really makes it a shame to be cutting stuff down <clears throat> as you're trying to enjoy the trail. And uh, actually, if, if people were to ever visit Norton Pond in Colchester this late in the fall here, they did an incredible, massive clear cut along the, the banks of the pond. So there's like no vegetation on either side of the trail. Maybe the, the, the whoever did the work is probably thinking they're doing a neat, a neat job, but that's really a bad job because they're, they're taking away all the native plants, and the only thing that's going to go back there are invasives. That's, that's what's going to take over. So, you know, I think the timing and the extent of the trail maintenance <clears throat> needs to be discussed um, and carefully done going forward. Okay, thank you, Frank. Kim? Let me unmute myself for a second. So just to, to make a note on this, um, I would love to note that these these are great concepts. The invasives and pollinator pathway are excellent. That's definitely two aspects that I really anticipate uh, outside organizations are going to need to support DEP with. Bottom line is at this point within DEP, the capacity within what we have, um, we barely have single maintainers. We do not have maintainers directly dedicated to this trail. And therefore, some of the timing is dependent on the capacity that we have internally. So um, I definitely would love to see within this infrastructure 
discussion, some of those recommendations, but also some um, thoughts and insight on how we can team more directly with the towns, some different concepts on that. I think Kevin will probably be speaking to that. And again, I just want to reiterate with my comment that um, it is a little bit of a concern to me that I'm not seeing much about uh, recreational infrastructure and inventory uh, related to the trail and connections to some of our regions, which um, are really important when we're thinking about the economic viability of this area. Um, I'd like to see some more of that information combined with some of our, our infrastructure. So um, just putting that comment in there. Again, these are good recommendations. I do think that we need to think about external partnerships for some of that management because this is a 40 mi 40, 43 mile corridor, um, po potentially uh, looking externally for different grant opportunities for pollinator pathways around this may be a great partnership and collaboration opportunity with DEP. Okay, uh, Greg, I see your thumbs up. Did you want to have a have a chance to comment? No, it's just agreeing with what Kim was saying. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yep. And to to your point, Kim, um, we are you know we're we're working on that. Um, those are those are elements that have yet to come out yet. Um, they would probably see those in the next workshop. Um, and then also parts of this workshop. These were just sort of the cheerful side of this presentation. Uh, Kevin and I were talking about like the difficult, now, now we're gonna go in for the heavy lift, but that was sort of the cheerful like, oh, how can you get people engaged in the trail and in a fun way and maintenance? So that was the fluffy side of this presentation. Now let's go into the deep dive. Is there anybody else had any questions or comments? Okay. Um, let's see if we're over here. All right, um, so this is just a, a photo that Stan Malcolm took in December 27th. Um, it was back on the trail and it was just such a, it's a beautiful photograph, um, but it also shows high water from the rain flowing across the trail in the place in places and then freezing. But he took some beautiful photographs of that. So just pop that into the, into the element. So in, in general, um, overall infrastructure concerns, and um, as we move forward, this is in the viewpoint of, um, from the viewpoint of the interviews with the towns. Um, I wanna stress that. So the overall infrastructure highlights of concerns include accessibility to the trail, including, uh, and Kevin, you could jump in at any point, um, especially at gated areas near intersections, uh, there's no consistency or accessibility. We are gonna be relying um, and, and in, importing a lot of the data that uh, the Last Green Valley did as um, a, per our accessibility study that they did uh, for the trail. Um, and we'll be in, including that into a lot of the maps and the, um, the overall, um, you know, recommendations that come into the plan on the infrastructure chapter. Another important element is the parking area improvements to allow for parking near the trail without impacting field of view uh, at intersections. Um, the, and then also improving the, um, the, the drainage off the site, the, the relative um, need for the number of spaces to increase given the consideration, given the numbers of visitors um, at, the, at the park. Um, and that parks, cars are parked on the road, which can create a, a safety problem. Then there's um, identification of intersections. Um, that is a combination of the wayfinding plan that we're working on, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about next time, as well as um, people being aware that they are approaching an intersection, the safety at the intersection, the sight line, um, if there are any concerns. So um, Kevin has been working on assessments of the different intersections and we'll outline those in the plan, uh, you know, per, sec per, per uh, recommendations on maps that'll be produced for the plan. And then there's signage for wayfinding, um, easy awareness, uh, relative location. And this is a big safety issue for many people. So you want to sometimes know, uh, as you know, and we had a very extensive discussion with Hop River, um, 
Trail Alliance and uh, with um, Kevin, uh, as well as Pete uh, Harry from uh, our, our, our designer who's working on a wayfinding design that we, we, can, we can put into a map form so that it's infrastructure. It's not a true wayfinding plan. This will be a, uh, an overview of a recommendation to do wayfinding planning, um, similar to what the Hop River is uh, planning to do. But um, it gives it the one of the major things that comes up is the understanding of where you are on the trail at any given point, um, because the cell service out there is not uh, not particularly uh, conducive to um, to understanding where you are minute to minute. Um, and peep, it is important for all users to understand where they are on the trail, um, what the grades are gonna look like. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many people I interviewed that they said, we didn't realize it was gonna be such a gr grinding climb back to East Hampton from, you know, from Hebron. Oh my gosh, that was, a, that was quite an incline. Um, so that was, uh, that's what we're doing for overall infrastructure highlights. So this is our municipal, what uh, Kevin and I were trying to encapsulate, um, there, there's a lot of comments we got, but we tried to encapsulate them into municipal views of the airline trail park infrastructure um, and the viewpoints that were expressed to us. So these are the four of, these are four of them. Um, there were some other minor ones, but these were the primary ones is that the airline state park trail is a Connecticut state park. Um, and DEP is responsible for the ongoing maintenance and new infrastructure improvements. Um, then there's the airline steel trade park is a major economic asset and they were willing to contribute our time and manpower. And we're even willing to contribute 20% of funding, whether it's municipal or they found another grant or to match a recreational trails grant to DEP. And then there's another viewpoint, which is the airline state park trail is a town asset and they're willing to assist with maintenance, you know, trails committees or towns, but really DEP has to fund those major infrastructure projects. And then last, uh, airline state park trail is an asset um, and we're willing to contribute 20% to fund new infrastructure. But if we're gonna do that, DEP really ought to maintain it after construction. Um, so there's, I think this, what we, what boils down to, and Kevin, I think I'm right on this one, we, we, we talked about it to summarize, is that what we came away with is that there's a, a, a deep need for increased communication between um, town stakeholders and DEP on a regular basis, um, so that a lot of these points or viewpoints can be either seen or understood in a, in a more constructive context for uh, ongoing work on the trail. Would that be a fair assessment of what you and I came away with? Yeah, Jean, I, I think that is a very fair assessment. And I can jump in here. Um, I don't mean to be silent to the group as, as I have been you know, integral to this process getting us this far. Um, so again, by means of introduction, I'm Kevin Grindle uh, with Bart and LeJudis, a consulting engineering firm um, uh, wearing, wearing my consulting uh, hat, um, I am looking at the infrastructure of the overall trail, um, wearing my constituent hat from the town of Hampton. Um, I'm also a trail user and advocate of all things uh, bike, pet, and, and, and multi-use trail, trails through the state. So I am looking at this project specifically, but uh, uh, be, uh, be sure that I, I'm, I'm wearing multiple hats in doing so. Um, so through specifically the infrastructure portion, um, Gene, I think you really hit the nail on the head in regards to the, the varying viewpoints we did see. Um, and again, you know, uh, we did interview uh, members or, or, you know, townspeople from all 12 of the, of the member towns uh, specifically. Uh, we were seeking input from, uh, from Public Works, from Park and Rec, uh, from Economic Development. Um, in many cases, uh, from selectmen, uh, town managers, town council members, effectively, you know, we were, we were asking, we were soliciting information from anywhere we could get it. Um, because really, the more comments that we have to build upon, uh, the better this overall master plan is going to be and specific to the infrastructure component. So obviously, you are going to get a different frame of reference when talking with a highway department maintainer in regards to how they look at uh, their involvement and engagement of the trail, then you're going to get when you're talking to someone in the economic development end of things. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, to go back to, you know, Kim's earlier comment, you know, those, those recreational resources are also something that G&I mm -hmm. were, were looking very closely at. And while we were receiving some of those, those comments from the 12 member towns, um, we were also being very cognizant uh, on our own behalf. And, you know, effectively, let's, let, let's not keep our blinders on and just look within the, you know, the right of way of the rail corridor acknowledging that many people are using this corridor to access uh, other real high value recreational opportunities around the trail. Um, you know, there are countless land trust properties, countless state uh, state properties, uh, be it, you know, uh, adjacent state parks, uh, something uh, something so specific as in my own town, in the town of Hampton, you know, a majority of the, of the trail goes, uh, you know, bisects Goodwin State Forest. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of that particularly just because that's the section of trail that I'm on the most. Um, however, in many towns, you do have those adjacent uh, land uses that really become, you know, instrumental to making this state park a success. Um, because, you know, in many cases, some of the comments we hear will be, well, okay, that, that, that was a nice walk, but we were using it to get to somewhere, effectively using it to get from point A to point B. Um, and, and it wasn't necessarily the objective of the user is to come and experience the airline trail state park. It was to get to another section or, or collaboratively use, uh, use parks in, in, you know, in parallel. Um, and also recognizing that the user groups, um, you know, there is, a, you know, over 50 miles of this corridor, you know, we are seeing heavy equestrian use in some locations. We're seeing heavy mountain bike use in others. Uh, we're seeing opportunities for, you know, more passive recreation when we get into, you know, a town centers such as Wyndham or East Hampton, where it's, you know, a shorter walk between, you know, economic drivers, um, you know, out in the, you know, out in the more rural towns of Pomfret and Thompson and my own town in Hampton, um, when we're talking about, you know, intersections that are literally miles apart, you know, there may be some more long distance walkers and, and, and long distance runners. Um, so really, you know, looking at that when we're driving this inter this infrastructure conversation really is 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 front and center here too. Um, but again, looking at this slide specifically, you know, Gene, you hit the nail on the head in regards to these viewpoints. Um, we have received, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to say many comments, but um, a, a a repeat comment in regards to, hey, why why are we talking about this? This is a Connecticut State Park. It's, it, you know, let the DEP deal with this. Um, frankly, that is a very fair statement that I'm not in a position to, to, uh, to dispute. Um, usually, there are other communities that are saying, hey, um, you know, this is a true economic driver of our urban centers. Um, I'm thinking specifically the towns of East Hampton, the town of Willimannock, um, uh, by geographic reference, you know, Hebron is a real advocate to what this trail can become for their town center and, and, and working very hard to make those physical connections. Um, obviously, Putnam, you know, looking at Airline North, um, Putnam is a great opportunity that I think will, you know, we will see inroads on moving forward into the future as far as the investment that are being made within the Putnam uh, corridor as we speak. Um, but then there are, you know, there are other towns that are saying, hey, you know what, yeah, we can, we can contribute 20% if we really needed to, but, you know, it's, it's the trail goes through our, our town and that's pretty much where it ends. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, you know, there are, there are many towns that are kind of begrudgingly uh, doing some of the maintenance, uh, some of the storm damage, uh, you know, a response. And there are other towns who are actively doing it, saying it, saying it, hey, this is this is part of our program. We're happy to do it. So I think in the overall, and forgive me because I am getting ahead of ourselves here as far as the slides are con concerned, but I think that's something we really will be focusing on. Is you know a lot of the outcome, a lot of you know Gene and I's discussion here uh, will revolve around a communication and b what can be uh, you know. What what are kind of the dependables? What 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 can the towns uh, be, uh, de be, de be depending on the state for, and what can the state be looking to the towns to lead? Um, I think the initial conversation about the poll pollinator pathways kind of leads in in portion to that conversation by saying, hey, 
you know, not everything is coming out of out of the state here. You know, there are some kind of ancillary or, or amenity features here that the towns really do have to get on board with and support. And I think, you know, to Jane's reference, and we'll talk about this in a bit too, as far as the Cadillac portions of the Cadillac options, you know, I kind of coined that term by saying, well, does, you know, do we want the Chevrolet option or the Cadillac option? Um, forgive me for the for the flippant comment there, but you know it it, it does speak to you know if you go into a, a dealership and say I want to buy a car, you know that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and, and I think there are people here that are looking for purely this photo in front of us. You know, hey, I'd really like to walk down here and keep my feet dry. And then there are other people on this call and in the community that say, man, you know what? I don't want to interact with intersections, and I'd rather have pedestrian bridges over state highways. Um, you know, all of those comments are very valid, but they do, in my mind, need to be ranked differently as far as the overall priority of this infrastructure and this master plan. So, but again, I am getting ahead of myself. So, Jane, you did give me an opportunity to talk. I think I, uh, I, I might have taken a little more, uh, <laughs> more oxygen than you were hoping on that one. But uh, um, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in as we move forward on this too. No problems. Um, that's great. You're great, great overview. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just going to go, let's see if I can go backwards a little bit. Let's see if it, um, it so Kevin, so I, it's a nice balance working with, with everyone, and especially Kevin, because, you know, he really is drilling in and on all the, it, it, the most difficult part of writing this plan is balancing what people anticipate that is going to come from the plan. And so, you're trying to meet many masters as we write this. So um, as I mentioned at that previous workshop, providing all these different consultants is gonna get a balance. Um, and what I'm trying to also do as the project manager is to stay true to the mission. Um, and how does it, how does the airline trail, the, the mission of the project is how does the airline trail uh, benefit the towns uh, ultimately, what happens needs to happen to the airline trail for it to benefit the towns, and then um, how can the towns better take advantage of their proximity to the to the trail? Um, and if this does go back, um, I'll point to a picture. See, um, the, these are this happens to be a pollinator pathway. I just want to note on the the generating enthusiasm. This is a pollinator pathway project in Cheshire on the Farmington River, um, the Farmington Cheshire Canal uh, Heritage Trail. We'll get the terminology right. Um, and then this one down here is, um, is a major economic draw for the town of Shelburne, Mass. It's the um, Bridge of Flowers. Um, and so it, it's just that element of how can you both have you know, a recreational fun thing to do and something that's going to attract and be unique. And so I think we always have to keep our mind open to different uses on the trail and how do we expand it. So those, so here's, um, so the next slide, this is um, trail storm events. I, we use this, um, Kevin and I talked about this, we decided to use this as an example for communication. And um, in this particular slideshow, um, in this workshop, and there's other things that we want to talk about in terms of communication. But storm trail storm events is a big deal. Um, you know, I've worked in emergency management with um, the different regions, the Demis regions, and um, so I know it from the town perspective or a regional perspective. And it's been interesting trying to translate that into understanding what happens in trail systems and recreational systems. So. From the town's viewpoints, again, town viewpoint, um, the issues are continuity and conditions for users and that it's important to maintain that. So how quickly can we get the trails up and functional again? And who's going to do that? Um, it's important to find an optional alert mechanism to communicate to trail users. Um, existing conditions, especially after a storm. And that leads to things like safety protocols with flooding or unstable slopes or erosion, or if a public works team or a highway, a DOT highway teams finds that a bridge is, on the, is not safe, that may be a bridge crossing. And how do we quickly, very quickly communicate that to, um, to, to the public and, and to trail users, you're, you're seeing my, my background in transportation planners planning seep through here also. Um, so there probably is a mechanism kind of like what CONDOT has where you do have an alert system. And um, I've asked uh, 
uh, Pete Harry to include a, uh, a special section on the website where you could have on time, um, if the website ends up going and being supported by the towns, uh, someplace where public works directors or rec trails, it can be a reporting mechanism to trail users and a shared experience um, for public works directors and towns to better understand what's happening moment to moment on the trail if they see something. The other thing is the majority recognize the hard work done by Connecticut DEP and the fact that it's understaffed in many of the districts. And it's not an issue of it. Of it there's no um, issue here. They understand and the, they were com comments to us about, we understand that you know the, the DEP is doing the best that they can to maintain the trails and maintain the conditions on the trails. It is a, and it's not an issue of you know how can they, how can they allocate things better or do things better? It really is just a unique um, to state park. Um, it's a unique state park that runs through state forests and other state parks. And so you've got, um, you know, we've got a tremendous team and Matt Quinn and, and Dave Buckley who are doing a, a, a lion's uh, work in, in trying to keep track of and maintain a lot of this infrastructure on the, on the trail. Um, but it's bigger. It, it, because it's so linear and it's so long, everybody is saying it's just bigger than your average state forest or state park. It, it's a unique situation. So they'd like to communicate better with DEP on that. Um, the majority of the towns want to see an airline state park trail point person communication network with DEP for major events and coordination for cleanup um, on, a, on an on-time basis. And then the majority of towns want to minimize uncoordinated firestorm volunteer efforts. You know, um, from my demos days, um, working with the, with the um, when I was working with the regional team, um, this is what is called the, um, you know, the teams of volunteers that come out. Um, and conditions may not be safe. Um, the citizen corps, you know, every town, every region has a citizens corps, or the town has enthusiastic volunteers. So it, communication, what we the takeaway from this particular parts of our interviews was communication is really, really important. That's what it really boils down to. Kevin, you have any other thoughts on that before I go to the next slide? No, no, Jane, I, I think I think specific communication is a lot of the feedback that we got was when towns are pressed and somebody sees, you know, your next slide or our next slide will have fallen trees. Um, when when somebody is walking the trail and sees a fallen tree, they're more apt to contact the local selectman and the local public works department in the town they're currently hiking in mm -hmm. because they do look at this in a very personal basis. Now, recognizing we're looking at this in both the personal and very, you know, granular, granular and also kind of that 10,000 foot view where we're looking at this as 50 miles across half the state. But for somebody who's hiking the trail in Lebanon and they sees a tree down, they're not going to call the, you know, the DEP, you know, maintainer. They're going to call the first selectman's office or the highway garage in Lebanon. And, 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 and that communication is going to be key whether there's somebody in the town of Lebanon's highway department that can go out and remove that tree, or if it has to rise to the occasion of calling, you know, DEP staffers to do it. Um, that line of communication becomes frustrating from both the, the bottom up and the top down. And, and, and I think that was comments that we were receiving from many of the park and rec departments and many of the public works departments that are engaged in this on a regular basis. Also recognizing that in the day of social media, if that tree is not cleaned up in 30 minutes or less, there's going to be a negative comment left. So we're all up against that in regards to how can we be the most, you know, feasibly responsive, but responsive as we can, while not again having those, you know, volunteer firestorms, recognizing we don't want people out on the trail with with chainsaws, you know, wielding chainsaws, thinking they're doing a good deed because they're 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 clearing a trail whereas they wouldn't think about doing so in an overall state park because it's a different setting. Okay, right. So, um, so these are um, the future airline state park infrastructure and maintenance planning. These were some um, photos taken by Stan um, out on the trail just after in November and December of just some, some not major damage, not like major washouts, um, but this was um, just some tree falls, some branches, you know, you look at this particular photo, it's, you know, oh, well, people are just, it's just a minor, you know, 
the, the trail's wet and we can pick up branches. Um, oh, what's happening over here? Is that going to be a washout at some point? Um, oh, that's not too hard to push aside. Oh, may, maybe we need a chainsaw. And that's where you start going, oh, maybe not. So towns seek regular communication methods with DEP to coordinate seasonal maintenance. So um, some of the recommendations that we're thinking of coming up with um, to run them by you is to mirror what is a uh, CONDOT offers as a, it's a, a state transportation improvement program. Um, so it's a, it's a very complex process. We don't have to get quite that bureaucratic. Um, I've, wor I've worked the process for 10 years in my old job, uh, longer than that actually. And, um, but it's also a planning process. So if we can mirror the planning process similar to what CONDOT and the towns and the councils of government do, maybe we, there could be an annual meeting in January of 12 towns um, and their representatives, whether it's a, the alliance, there's a 12 town alliance that sits with them or 12 towns, public works directors and park rec directors. Um, however it's formed, and we're not, we're not drilling down on that quite yet as to who it would be, um, because I think that has to be somewhat organic, um, but they would sit down with DEP and four of the councils of government because sometimes there's funding that comes through the council of government, which I'll reference later, um, and sit down in a workshop or a retreat or whatever you want to call it to review collective needs to infrastructure and maintenance that they anticipate in the coming year and how best to coordinate it. So it's basically just a yearly check-in. Um, everybody comes together, you sit down, if it's still COVID, we have a Zoom meeting, but somebody architects the meeting and, um, and holds it. And, um, and that could either come from DEP or it could come from an alliance of the 12 towns. So then there's collective ideas for grant making could be discussed for major infrastructure. And this is where you have that Ford or Chevy versus Cadillac um, so that there's a better understanding as a group what are we looking at? Um, you know, maybe, maybe we, this, you think it's a catalog project, but we all agree that it's a project that's critical. So all of a sudden it gets, it's, it's a Ford project that's really, really important. You know, it's really, really important. It's affordable. It's important, but it's, it's again, that's communication tool. And then review town plans for the larger Cadillac improvement projects plan for recreational trails grants, or this would be something where, you know, oh, what's DEP going to do for just infrastructure that's just general? And then a town might say, well, we don't, this is, this is very true of transportation projects too. We don't want just a standard bridge. We don't just want your standard beam bridge with the really ugly guard rails and all that kind of stuff. We want a stone bridge with an arch. And DEP will probably go, I mean, DOT would probably go, oh, well, we don't know, I got to get a design criteria and et cetera, et cetera on that. And that's something to think about for, you know, towns that do want to do something that's a little bit above the board and, and, but at least everybody's aware that that's what's going forward. And then just talking about emergency planning. Okay, what are we going to do this year? What's going to happen? You know, what's going to happen uh, with this contact or we have a new person on board. So it's just, uh, that was just, one idea that came out of our Kevin and my discussions is just at a minimum have an annual meeting of all the parties involved once this project's done so that everybody's communicating on an equal basis. Um, and then this is a more extreme. Um, this was a, a photo forwarded to me. Um, Kevin has it also in flooding. Uh, this is the trail. This is not a stream. This is the trail. This was that Storm Irma, wasn't it? I think Storm Irma overtook the trail with the uh, stream nearby. And so, you know, it's a, that, that goes together with, you know, well, what's happening in the stream nearby? I mean, how come we're getting so much storm runoff that it overfloods the trail? And maybe it, is this going to be a common occurrence? So those are the sort of things where, yeah, it's probably, gonna, it'll, it'll resolve itself, but you want to look, is this like a hundred year event? Uh, uh, a 500 year event, um, how do we, how, are there methods to mitigate this or do we just plan to shut the trail down at this time? Um, obviously in this particular instance, yes, you're gonna shut the trail down, but, um, but it's those sort of discussion items that you wanna have. And then um, 
this is not Storm Irma, but this happens to be a particular uh, photo that um, Stan took of um, the Raymond Brook area and um, or Bernstein area that so it just shows that tremendous a lot of water flow that comes through these uh, every aspect of this park there is streams running through and potential for flooding um, but anyway so here's your question what are the single most important tools needed from DEP to support airline state park trail towns and I'll then be, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be home in about two comments and insights does anyone have any I'm not seeing, uh, people might have to pipe in because I'm not, let me just see if oh. my hands up. I'm scrolling through my, all right. So everybody's good with the direction we're heading so far on this? Oh, I got Bruce. Love seeing those. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 have, I have a couple of uh, I, comments, I suppose, here. Uh, the, having having lived through much of this over the last 20 years, uh, certainly if you go back to your, your first slides, and you, and you don't need to, um, uh, the gates and intersections and signage, uh, I think that's something that's been identified and is being worked on. Uh, you know, cattle gates, you know, were, were designed uh, initially and put in because they were cheap. Uh, effective mechanisms to keep uh, ATVs and snowmobiles off. Uh, uh, you know, really back when uh, there there wasn't as much usage. Uh, we've got we're, we're at a point now where they basically self police now. So you know we we can in fact go to a single or a double bollard, and that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, and uh, the corollary to that is provide Americans with Disabilities Act uh, uh, you know egress. Uh, which is critical uh, to, you know, if you want to use any federal funding. Uh, so that's that piece. Um, maintenance, uh, you know, is, is, <laughs> uh, is a topic that's bandied about for decades. And uh, it's a perennial problem because they're state parks. Uh, if, if, they were, uh, if they were not state parks, it's not a problem because uh, DOT writes into the construction contracts, you have to maintain it. <laughs> when we when we hand this off to you, you got it. You own it. Uh, it doesn't work that way with state parks, and so uh, there's going to have to be some sort of a mechanism. And everyone's been struggling with it. Uh, you know, do 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 you do you have a component of of the Connecticut Recreational Trails Program that talks about maintenance? You know, that's that hasn't happened. Uh, is there more? Is there more of a a line item uh, within deep, within within parks? I know that's been discussed over the years. That hasn't particularly happened, although we we know that there's a substantial amount of money that goes toward this, right? Uh, and then we've got essentially, out of the goodness of their hearts, various towns, not all of them, as we know, uh, that uh, the DPW goes out, and picks up their chainsaw, and fix stuff, fixes stuff. Uh, or fills in the occasional hole, or uh, uh, you know, digs out the occasional ditch, uh, as well as, by the way, uh, a bunch of uh, you know, really, I think, important um, uh, advocates that are out there, you know, doing things like digging out those those drainage ditches and uh, uh, and doing a lot of work out there, and that's a function, I think, of all of the towns agreeing that. There's certain things that advocates can do and certain things they can't do. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the famous picture of a guy, you know, drinking beer with a chainsaw, uh, you know, that's, that's what we don't want, right? <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of other pictures of people doing fantastic work that, that we need, right? So th th that's a huge component of this. And then finally, um, there's a very real component of this of, 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 of money. You know where where the money is coming from. Uh, is is this money coming from state bonds? Is this money coming from federal places? Uh, so you know, conference resurfacing is federal tap money, for instance. But there's a lot of other money out there that's federal, but not tied to FHWA. You know, lots of 
uh, you know, CMAT. There's all sorts of money out there. But the, but the, the problem is that they, they come with different rules and different red tape. So we, I, we, I, I don't know how far down that road you want to go, but it's useful to at least understand it because uh, it does dictate what policy becomes, right? Ultimately. So I just want to, I want to throw that out there. I don't know. If, I don't know if I just, you know, handed you a bag of worms, but uh, yeah. Nope. Great, co great comments, Bruce. And um, yep, I've been, I worked with uh, under that program and as an MPO, director of an MPO for 15 years. So I pretty know that we're, we're, we're going to touch on it in the plan uh, under the funding mechanism. And, but we're, we're not going to go deep dive because actually you need the plan. They don't want to do anything unless you have the plan. So. Uh, oh, oh yeah. It's chicken. It's yeah. chicken and egg. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Kim. Yeah. So following up with a lot of what Bruce says, and this is this is great, by the way. I really like the way this is coming together, and I think um, all of you are putting together some, you know, sort of an inventory of uh, infrastructure needs as well, which is going to be really important to all of us. Is deep. Um, I'm hearing, and I I definitely agree that uh, we'll need some sort of process and kind of clarity on, on how we can work through these things together, whether, um, we look at agreements between towns that are willing to put some of the effort in and looking for funding options with that. I will say, you know, that's going to be the challenging part within deep, but, um, we definitely can brainstorm through that. But, uh, I did want to know the, one of the things we need to be careful about and we've seen on some of the the long distance trails that we've had is this uh, interest in really maintaining the importance of this infrastructure to each of the towns we need to make sure we're communicating with DEP when um, different efforts are taken so I, I love the example of storm impacts because I think that we can come up with a preemptive plan before these things happen of how to communicate and how to get approvals of different types of efforts and how these should be done. But I know there has been a few occurrences where, where towns have taken some um, efforts in their own hands. And we have to be careful because if the wrong materials are put onto the trail, it could actually make it worse for trail users. So, you know, we need to, to be aware of what's happening before people go and clean out drainage ditches or otherwise. Um, but I think that can be a communication piece on our part to make sure that that's clear with everyone and kind of clear across the board. So I think this plan will help us to develop that. Great. Okay, the interest of time. So Kevin, um, this is where you're up. We're going to do a case study, quick, quick case study, and you just tell me when to move forward on the slides. But um, these are, uh, Wyndham, based on your interviews, what your findings were. So you want me to go to the next slide? Yeah, and, and Jean, you can you can push through these pretty quickly. I think this is just okay. kind of a, an example of what we're doing in each of the 12 towns is effectively, you know, recognizing that e each of the towns, and we chose Wyndham just as a brief example here, because Wyndham pro provides a very good opportunity to say there are very urban conditions. <clears throat> in fact, uh, between Wyndham and Putnam, the most urban conditions that you're going to see on this corridor, as well as Wyndham gets very quickly into more of a rural establishment into, you know, on the, on the eastern side of Wyndham into Chaplin. So, you know, these maps will be prepared and part of the, you know, the appendix and the overall master plan just acknowledging that there's the, there are these overall highlights. And then we drill down into each of the intersection conditions because recognizing that infrastructure is gonna be you know, a critical component uh, where the, the bike pad at user meets, the, meet, meets the, you know, the automobile, you know, meets that vehicular user. And in, in many of the cases, these become the most critical path to making a, the user experience a safe one uh, to Bruce's point. Obviously, the gates and ADA accessibility component come into play in, you know, these intersections, the parking lots, you know, effectively, how do people go from the DOT experience to the DEP experience? So just, and Jane, you can, you can scroll through these pretty quickly, but recognizing that, you know, that quick analysis of, 
where do we need to provide handicap accessibility and we go to improve gates, improve bollards uh, versus you know, sidewalk extensions versus something so simple as crosswalks and pedestrian warning signages. Um, some of the, you know, the higher lift components, um, thinking just again here in Wyndham being the Route 203 intersection, uh, you know, where we have you know, trail, trail users intersecting state highways where you know, vehicular uh, you know, uh, vehicle counts are higher and uh, average daily tra uh, travel uh, speeds and numbers are higher. Um, you know, recognizing there may be the opportunity for more aggressive, uh, you know, pedestrian notification systems. I think I'm thinking the RRFB, the Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacons. Um, I'm thinking, you know, going back to the Farmington Canal uh, Trail, the reference in Cheshire where they've installed a hawk signal and DOT was, was party to that. Um, just acknowledging there are a lot of opportunities here uh, to really make that pedestrian uh, user experience a lot safer with in these cases, short money because it could just be signage. Uh, this one here, uh, the Route Six, uh, Route 66 intersection on the east side of Willimantic. Again, when we can cross at signalized intersections, it's always preferable. But that is also something that's kind of the recommendation in in in, in the master plan is going to say, you know, where are the intersections that need you know uh, short money to uh, to be improved. Uh, where are the kind of the Chevy options? And again, going back to the Cadillac options, you know, maybe there are some long-term goals of, you know, thinking this intersection here specifically with the Route 203 crossing in Wyndham. Hey, you know what? Uh, to, to Photoshop in the, uh, the, the bridge that was recently constructed in Pomfret into this image um, can get people visualizing what could be achieved here in Wyndham very easily in the, in the long-term objective. Um, and I'm thinking that would be kind of outside the bounds of the general maintenance plan. Uh, but you know what? There's no harm in, uh, in, in, you know, in shooting for the stars and seeing what happens. Um, so, and then moving through this, okay, you very quickly come out of the urban setting into, you know, a very rustic setting where you, you wind up kind of experiencing the whole, uh, the whole parameter of the airline trail in a very short walk where you go through, <coughs> you know, uh, the paved conditions in Wyndham uh, through the, you know, uh, very unique white cedar bog, and then out into the chaplain side where you get into uh, a, a much more, um, I'll say typical trail condition. Um, and then speaking, okay, you know, specifically from Wyndham and then jumping to Airline North and into Putnam, um, you know, both of these become kind of the heavy lifts as far as, you know, we're concerned. Uh, making sure that we're we're connecting these communities, um, recognizing that you know I'm sure many of us uh, on on this webinar uh, sat through Kim's conversation yesterday in regards to the ranking uh, of the uh, of the current um, Rec Trails grant uh, being you know making those connections into the underserved communities, underserved populations, and that is something that mirrors their DOT's objectives in regards to the Community Connectivity Grant Program. Uh, where we're bringing sidewalks into trails, uh, bringing communities uh, to the out of doors into, into nature corridors such as this. Um, I think that really becomes first and foremost on conversations that Gene and I have had with both uh, the, uh, the constituents in Wyndham and Putnam. Really, they have a large population that can very easily get to and use these trails with minimal effort and minimal input. Uh, we just have to make those connections. Um, so, and, and, and really that is kind of the overall of what we've been doing in each of the 12 towns. And again, um, looking to make the, make the master plan read uh, efficiently. Um, I'll say that all of this information will be in appendix, uh, appendices uh, so that you can dig into this as need be. But again, uh, trying to make that plan kind of a, a efficient for the, uh, for, for the overall reader. So, um, much of that data will be in the back and not, uh, not, 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 not buried in the text of the report, if you will. Um, so with that, Jane, I can, I can turn you back over to this current slide. But again, I was instrumental in this project, too. So I will be very interested to jump in, uh, jump, <laughs> jump in this conversation, too. So this was, um, so you saw the slide before was the um, Putnam, that's an intensive planning effort. Um, so it's a Cadillac, but it's a long, long distance Cadillac project where they're trying to figure out how to make that connection to Thompson, the Thompson Trail. And then this one was, no, every good plan yields effort. 
um, eventually. It's been, I've been doing this over 30 years and um, generally when there's enthusiasm and there's been a tremendous enthusiasm for filling in, and as I referenced before, this particular gap in the airline trail in East Hampton, which should have been one of those low hanging fruit you know, um, easy fixes, but because it was designated as a wetlands, uh, it has to be built as a boardwalk. And um, so this is the, on the right is the photograph of Lori on her last tour as recreational trails and Sam Gold and um, uh, other, other folks uh, from East Hampton. Um, Jeremy Hall was out with us and just walking the trail and up here it stops, up here it stops. Um, and so, there was a, from this meeting, we, um, the plan was already in place, but we said, why don't we go for the congressionally directed spending effort that's coming up? And Sam Gold, who's a mover and shaker in River Cog said, yeah, he, he's happy to put the grant in. So he put it, that was the cog, putting it in on behalf of the town and it was recently awarded. So it's getting built. So yes, there is a Christmas sometimes um, with the airline trail when you least expect it. Um, Kevin, did you have any thoughts on that one? I, no, just, I, I think that just that that just speaks to the the patience that's required in, on on all of our behalves at times. Um, I, I think having met with volunteer organizations throughout this corridor as well as town staff, um, there there is the the desire to have things happen yesterday. And I, I can't I can't blame that effort. Um, I encourage it whenever I'm out in the communities meeting with or with staff and, and with volunteers. Uh, but recognizing this this section here is, you know, a, as you measure it, less than half a mile. And it's taken us literally 10 years to get this far. And it was a Christmas present when we acknowledged uh, when we received acknowledgement that it was funded this year. So. Um, it, it took a lot of different efforts from a lot of different people from a lot of different avenues. And to Bruce's point, we did, you know, uh, you know, the funding portion was a was a, a creative and collaborative, I'll call it experience. Um, it, it, it took a long time. It took a decade to get there. But uh, pleased to report that within the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, uh, that gap will be closed, connecting East Hampton to Portland. And this next slide, um, you know, speaks to Portland's effort. Uh, and, 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 and seeing, you know, uh, members of the East Hampton uh, Trail Committee on this call, um, as well as I'm not seeing specifically, but looking for any, any Portland members too, um, really that critical path for connecting those two communities. And I'm thinking the conversations and collaborations between East Hampton and Portland, um, and then Airline North up to, you know, Putnam and Pomfret uh, into Thompson, it really takes these communities to not think of themselves as an island. Uh, you know, not take our 169 town hats off at times and really looking at this 12 town component as really a, a required conversation moving forward. Um, but that goes back to kind of speaking to some of the recommendations that Gene and I are coming up with as far as, you know, that annual meeting and that collaboration to determine, you know, is there something that of like mind needs to be done in East Hampton? And is that the very same thing that has to be done in Thompson? So rather than making two phone calls to DEP, uh, we sit at the table with them once and determine that, you know, it's one job and not two. That's it's just spread 50 miles apart. Um, so I recognizing that um, we're three minutes over, um, I'm happy to stay on. But I, uh, if there's comments and insights as to what you've seen so far about the approach that we're taking um, and, and, you know, the planning approach, the, the goal is to uh, we will probably do it in, in the full plan itself. We will do a couple of examples, but then as Kevin referenced, there'll be an appendices with the town by town layout of infrastructure needs, um, the, the, the low hanging fruit version. Um, we're not going to get into um, we're not going to get into the super special projects unless they're already planned out. Um, we never, we didn't have a budget for hiring a, an engineering firm to, to engineer out special projects. So um, it'll be a reference if there are towns that have, when, like for instance, when we met with Willimantic Wyndham, we were in Willimantic at the town hall with the Wyndham officials. We said, what are your big projects? What are your dreams? Dream big. Um, I come from 
uh, a planning background where I believe in, insti in instituting projects because um, it's not just the plan. I, I get a, I, you know, some part of being a planning professional is having projects. And, you know, when they built the Nyanic Bay Boardwalk that, you know, I wrote the plan for that. We got the first segment of that. Nobody believed that they, we could build something on the bay, that it wouldn't get washed away by the first hurricane, et cetera, et cetera. And here we have the Nyanic Bay Boardwalk. So when I was talking, been talking to towns, I dare people to dream big because it can happen. It can happen when you least expect it. And it especially can happen when everybody works together. So that's my little, that's my little soapbox. But does anybody have any comments? Insights. Just looking at my list here. I, I would I would just say one thing about uh, you know. Uh, well, it's more than one thing. But uh, uh, but th this idea, this idea of of design uh, with funding in mind, uh, you know, the last piece of Putnam comes to mind. It's, it's a Western and Samson design. We're trying to figure out how to get down that enormous ramp of dirt. Uh, I think they'll figure it out. But uh, uh, DOT recently just gave that a DOT project number uh, and uh, uh, and a two point eight million dollar uh, uh, price tag. Mm -hmm. Uh, as an example, so you, you know th this stuff. This stuff is on the state's radar, yeah. and so it's it's incumbent on us to make sure that we that 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 that, that we that everyone understands that, right? Uh, and and what's particularly interesting is that you know I don't no one knows how it's going to be funded. <laughs> uh, I'd be fascinated to figure out how that's going to work, but I I think it will because there's literally enough people that want that. Uh, to be done that that and and Thompson is another case in point, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everyone wants that to be done. Uh, there's just you know the snets getting finished. I mean you know Massachusetts. I talk to them all the time. They're working hard on the snet. They want that done. Uh, you know it, these connections are going to happen. So uh, that's the good part. You know the good part is there's recognition at the state level that there's money that needs to be spent. Uh, I think I think the hiccup you know, for a lot of this is that DOT looks at these projects and 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 kind of says, well, you know, we're funding this, but then we're kind of waving goodbye to it because it's a state park. You know, I think that's kind of what the mindset is. And so, so one of the things that we need to think about collectively is is how to how to how to you know, through communication, I suspect, uh, you know, you know, lessen that burden somehow, uh, you know. Uh, anyway, that's my that's my comment on this. Thank you, Bruce. Anyone else? One concept that we're we're that we're Kevin and I are throwing around is um, like in with DOT, there's the Town Aid Road. Um, funds that come through to towns. And maybe there's an option here with the help of the legislature um, to come up with, um, for those towns that abut state parks who want to come up with, you know, who want to help. Um, maybe there are segments um, that where the towns, because we, we certainly don't want to go into some sort of agreement uh, situation. Um, where you have to, you know, have a formal agreement, but maybe there's something with town aid road type of situation. You have a trail aid um, where the towns get some measure of funding per mile for assistance with their maintenance um, so that the towns can help with that. But again, that would be something that would, would have to come through as a, a long-term effort. Um, and then you definitely would have want to have those January workshops. So yeah, well, that's right. Cause, cause that stuff, that stuff needs to be, uh, you know, cast in stone two, three years beforehand, right? Right. So that that's a whole other kettle of fish. Uh, I would say one thing, you know, DOT uh, in, in the, uh, is doing kind of a mini grant called um, TRIP, which is community connectivity for uh, for rural towns, mm -hmm. uh, which which this fits very well. Uh, so there's money around. 
but again, you got to program it. You know, you, ha you have to have a project in order to fund it, right? So you, yeah, you need a plan to program it. You got to. That's exactly right. Yep. Sure, especially with DOT. Kim, did you have your hand up? Yeah, just to just to chime in for a second, what I will say is, if any funds are going to come, if we plan to have it come from DEEP, there will be uh, an agreement. So that's one thing I've been talking about a lot internally within DEP. Um, from the volunteer standpoint and for kind of trail maintenance agreements where it's volunteer or it's in kind, essentially, we're not putting money into that. Um, we can work through our trails policy and have a trail maintenance agreement, which is internally within parks. Um, if it were to be money transitioning, it would definitely end up in an agreement and would most likely end up with our land acquisition which is a much more formalized agreement so um we've had been having a lot of discussions on this point because i one of my roles in stepping into the trail um coordinator position is really identifying those agreements that we have with different organizations groups and municipalities so um we are looking at that a little more intently as we've had a few scenarios that have been on the brink of um, what can be considered an encroachment. So that's what I think is really important for all of our towns to understand. Don't improve the surface of the trail. Don't go in and do um, too much uh, work on the trail without directly working with us and meeting with us because it could result in a potential encroachment which could actually cause a lot more issues in getting maintenance done on the trail than than benefit it so um there is an interest in dps and to make sure that we're working very closely and coordinating more closely with all of our municipalities on these long distance trails okay anybody else any more comments maureen Hi. Yeah, I just I just wanted to clarify the uh, funding for that section of the airline trail. It's tap money that's going to um, make that connection at the end. And actually, I just received a conceptual drawing today of two different solutions. So it's very exciting. Oh, to see it. see oh that. that's you might be the first to get that. I haven't seen it. So that's that's great. Well, it's coming from our, our engineer. So, um, and they're, it's not a final at all. It's just um, part of the contract is that they provide two conceptual plans. So it's moving forward. And, you know, if our DPW and Pomfret, we have a lot of access areas. So it's easy for us to get to the trail. It might be easier than it is in some other towns for our public works. Um, and we'll, consult with Matt Quinn before we do, do any major um, work. So he always knows when we're out there and where we are. Um, and we do yeah. have sort of a, a, a maintenance agreement on the new section of the trail, which is being developed. Um, Pomfret did agree for a 10 year, it's, it hasn't been clarified yet what that means, but to assist with maintenance on that four mile section of the trail. So. Great. And Maureen, definitely um, CC me on anything that's happening with that. So Matt is definitely the person to kind of coordinate and check in with, but feel free to CC me because I'm able to work between the sections that Matt oversees as well as Dave um, and provide some continuity and some link to, um, you know, Tom Tyler and those kind of up the, the chain as needed. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? So um, the again, email me. Um, uh, you uh, the this video of this workshop will be posted on the website tomorrow, I believe. I hope Kelly will be able to do it, um, and as well as the PowerPoint. And then um, please email me or have anyone email me with their comments. Um, I will be keeping a database of the comments that that are given in this meeting and then also um, anybody that emails me with comments I'm keeping those also. And then January 17th next week you guys get a hey this from us for a little bit get the weekend. Um, we'll have marketing uh, website wayfinding and collaboration oh my. Um, and during this the collaboration portion we're going to be welcoming our guests. Um, and our partners and future, hopefully future, future partners, the Hop River um, Trail Alliance. Um, 
John Boldick and John Hankins will be uh, attending and giving an overview of what they're doing over at the Hop River Trail. Um, and it's pretty exciting stuff. So um, I look forward to seeing others spread the word um, to any other people who would like to come on board. And then we will have also the wayfinding, um, the beginnings of the wayfinding uh, the design concepts. And because um, we're going to have to start, figure out where to put these wayfinding signs or sort of some examples of where to put them. And, um, and then marketing. So how do we do collective marketing of the trail that is being being improved upon and and uh, and and constantly with millions of dollars. So um, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you for your participation. And um, we, uh, as I said, we have the next one um, next Tuesday at 530 to 630 and uh, look forward to seeing you then um, unless anybody has. Any other comments for the good of the order? I am uh, saying, hey, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you all for attending. Take care.